So now that we've reminded ourselves of the basic of hypothesis testing in terms of the classical method and the p-value method, we want to look at how this is systematically written down for us. This page, and you have a lot of them on your exam packet, um, you have several pages that look like this that have these hypothesis tests written out in long form. You can see that there's a lot of steps to it. There are these requirements at the top that you'll have to check. Um, sometimes um, check, sometimes not, depending on what the problem is asking for. A true um, hypothesis test, you would check the conditions to make sure that it's appropriate to conduct the hypothesis test. And then you would follow through the six steps. So step one, you determine your null and alternative hypotheses. Step two, you determine your alpha, your level of significance. Um, step three, you'll find something called the test statistic. And every section will have its own calculation for how that is formed. Step four is when you have to make a decision. Are you going to go the classical approach? And that'll lead you through steps four and five. Are you going to find some critical values and then determine whether or not the sample statistic you got in step three is past that? Or are you going to go the p-value approach, right? The probability approach. And then step six is state the conclusion which is just like all the other ones that we saw in 10.1, you write the conclusion with there is sufficient evidence, there is not sufficient evidence. Now keep in mind, you don't have to memorize these steps because it's all written for you in your exam notes packet. I just wanted to show you it right here. So this test is the one prop Z test that we're learning. And I even tell you what section you learned it in. You learned it in 10.2. And I'm telling you what calculator function it is with that one prop Z test. More on that later. So I'm giving you all the instructions right on the notes packet. So it's not a question of memorization. It's a question of following the procedure appropriately, filling in all the parts, showing all the work, etc. And then you'll have another one that looks very similar to that for 10.3, and then another one that looks very similar to that for 10.4. So there's no memorization. There's nothing um, that isn't on these pages for these tests other than all of the explanations that you're going to add in. But the process itself is all written down here for you. Okay, so let's go back and look at this. Before we want to start tackling this very large six-step process, we're going to remind ourselves how to do this step right here, step four, which is the um, critical value step, finding the critical values, finding your threshold for how far away does your sample data have to be to say, no, I don't think so, and reject the null hypothesis. So we are going to determine those critical values, and we already learned how to do this in chapter seven, chapter eight, and chapter nine. <laughs> They're the same type of critical Z values we've been finding for quite some time. So we're going to start off with finding the critical Z value when a, for a right-tailed test for a single proportion with alpha equal to 0.08. Now that right-tailed test, that's kind of important, so let me highlight that. That lets us know that which of the three pictures we're going to be looking at. So when you look back at step four, you have to choose which of the three drawings is the drawing you're going to go with. Since it's right-tailed, we know this is the drawing. So we're going to put down a line, we're going to shade our tail to be alpha, and alpha is 0.08, so you want to shade about 8% of your tail. And then we want to find that value. All right, so I've drawn and shaded a graph here, and believe it or not, that's about 8% of the tail shaded there, which looks like quite a bit, and it is, 8% is quite a lot. That means that the area in the right tail is 0.08, and that means the area in the left is 0.92. You must label this with the alpha and the little arrow and everything like that. And then you must below that vertical line put Z sub alpha, or if you like Z 0.08. But you have to label it just like it's labeled on this picture right here. Now it tells us that in order to find this, we could go to the bottom row of the t-table or use inverse norm. Well, the t-table is wonderful as long as I can use it. <laughs> so let me go look at the t-table. The t-table has um, the most commonly used values for z's and t's, but the area in the tails are these values up here, 0 0.25, 0 0.20, and so on. You'll notice the 0.08 is not in there. That means that we're not going to be able to use the t-table for this one because 0 0.08 is not a column that's in our table. So we're going to have to use the calculator. We're going to have to use inverse norm here. So let me type it up. All right, so if we don't have the calculator, we're going to have to use, excuse me, don't have the table, we're going to have to use inverse norm. So let me grab the calculator. 
So here I have the calculator. And you remember that in order to get a z-score, well, I can bring it up from the Chapter 7 Decision Matrix. So when you look at the Chapter 7 Decision Matrix, I know it's a little bit sideways, but when you want to find a z-score, which is this middle green part right here, you want to use inverse norm, left tail area, 0 and 1. So we need the left tail area, which we found to be point. 0.92 right here. So we know the left tail area is 0.92. That's what we're going to put into the calculator. So I'm going to go to distribution, which is above my variables button. I want to hit number three for inverse norm. Then I'm going to say 0 0.920 0 and 1. I'm going to go down to the bottom to paste. And I'm going to press enter. For the probability distributions, you have to hit enter a couple times in order to paste it and then run it. So we get 1.405. So that's our critical value. So Z sub alpha is equal to 1.405. And there we go. All right, now let's look at the next one. It says that alpha is 0 0.004 with H1, that's your alternative hypothesis, being that P is less than 0.3. Okay, so P means proportion, so that means that we're looking at a z-score again. Less than means it's a left-tailed test. So I want to look at the left-tailed test picture like this. I'm going to label my left tail with that 0 .003, which is, or 0 .004, which is not very much at all. And then I want to label that negative z-alpha down below. So that's what I'm going to do. So I have a left-tailed test picture. I drew um, an appropriate tail. Notice I'm not shading very much because 0 0.004 is very small. You should be shading the appropriate amount. When you're drawing and shading these pictures, you should be drawing and shading the appropriate amount. 8% should look roughly like what I have up here. 0 0.004 should look like what I have down here. When you have 0 0.004, don't shade half of the picture. That's not appropriate. All right, so now um, we know that 0 0.004 is not a column on our table, so we're going to be stuck using the calculator again. So let me go back to inverse norm, which is above the variables button. I hit number 3, hit 0 0.004, and I'll go down to paste and press enter, and press enter. And I get negative 2.652, which makes sense. I mean, make sure that when you come up with an answer that it, it seems appropriate for your problem, which this does. It seems like it's pretty far over there to the left, and indeed it is. So that's what we've got, and that's our result. All right, now let's do the last one. The last one is a two-tailed test with alpha equal to 0.1 or 0.20. Excuse me. So a two-tailed test is a little bit trickier because you're going to have to take that alpha value and cut it in half to draw this picture, and you're going to label each side with its own alpha over two. All right, well, since the two tails is 0 0.20, that means that each tail on its own is 0 0.10. All right, now 0 0.10 for each of the tails. Now notice we have them each shaded at 10%, and they're labeled with alpha over 2s. I've got the z alpha over 2, the negative z alpha over 2. All of that needs to be on there every last bit of it. You have to label, you have to point out, areas are, are labeled um, above, z-scores are labeled on the x-axis. Now this particular value is in the table, so we could use the table or we could use inverse norm, either one. So when you think about the area in the tail, it's 0 0.10. So you want the 0 0.10 column, you want to scroll to the bottom to the z-scores, and you can see that it's 1.282. That means that the z-scores are plus or minus 1.282. So you could get them from the table, or you could get it with inverse norm. That would work as well. Inverse norm would um, give you the negative value if you used 0 0.10, or the positive value if you used 0 0.90. But either way, the answer is actually the two of them, plus or minus z alpha over 2. Since it's a two-tailed test, just like with a confidence interval, it has two z-scores. As a matter of fact, confidence intervals and two-tailed tests kind of go hand in hand. They have the same critical values, um, z alpha over 2.